<laughs> yeah, uh, I can't say for too long today, but what I did want to do is, you know, as we are gearing up for the first official uh, public alpha testnet, one of the things we've been putting a ton, a ton of effort into is the development environment for Canon so that we can iterate quickly, experiment, onboard external developers, just have the entire thing be not in the core, not in the hands of just the core devs, uh, even though we're the ones driving it today, but really get everyone involved uh, with as little friction as possible. So under dev.pocketroll.com is where we have a lot of our in-progress documentation uh, for, the, uh, for the technical parts of Canon. So not tokenomics, but you know, if you go into protocol and you want to understand how the protocol works, there's a lot of things here. But if you want to go and start learning about the different actors on Canon, you've got a lot of things here. If you want to run a local net, we've got a video of myself talking, but then we also have very um, a long list of instructions uh, of things you can really just copy paste. Uh, I'm not going to go through the whole thing today, but what I did want to do is just kind of show how easy it is to spin this up. Um, kind of, let's, and this is going to be about five minutes of me uh, spinning up a gateway, uh, a gateway, spinning up a supplier, and then sending a relay end to end. Uh, I kick things off just to, uh, you know, just to expedite things. I already compiled all the protobufs and all of our mocks here. So you can see that everything's complete. And even though we do have some flaky tests on occasion, there are some tips in the instructions so that we can get to a good state. And then uh, all I did was go here and run this command called make local net up, which builds a bunch of containers. You know, everything's dockerized, everything's in a local Kubernetes cluster. It's the latest and greatest technology that uh, we love today. And what that does is spin up literally everything we need. So I press spacebar. And what you can see here is that we have you know, an Ethereum node running, like an, a local Anvil node. We have a gateway running. We have a validator running. We have a relay miner running. And if you go into each of these, the beauty here is not only, you know, do we have logs here, but we also have, you can click on each of these and it takes you to a Grafana dashboard with metrics and observability being exported for all of them. This is like, I know I'm, I'm going, like I'm going through this really fast, but each of the things I'm describing, like having this one command that spins all this up is huge. Having the visibility into these logs is awesome. Having the Grafana dashboards here is great. If we, for example, go uh, into the code and I can say, like I change the line to validated and completed claims and I and I save the file. We can see we've got what's called hot reloading. So immediately, you know, we change the code and everything locally is going to recompile. The Docker containers are going to rebuild. Everything is going to restart. And all I did was save a file. Um, I mean, kind of what this is going to enable in terms of development and iteration speed is uh, immense. Kind of the next cool thing that I wanted to show is how we can scale up uh, our local net. We've got this configuration file. Um, and I'm going through all this really fast because my goal here isn't to uh, dive deep on any specific component, but just show the breadth of tools that we have to enable developers. That was a kind of a quick side tangent. So going back to this local net config file, like if you look at this, uh, let's say we want to scale the number of relay miners to start simulating something real. We have, I'm going to set this to two. We go back here, boom, we've got a new relay miner already 
you know, loading a billion dollar container and being launched locally. Uh, same thing goes for the gateways. Boom. Uh, I save it. And there, we already have another gateway being deployed in our local environment. Uh, before I go into uh, running these manually, in case you need even more fine grain control, something that is, um, I also think is really cool is our end-to-end -end testing framework that I kind of just want to show off because the team's been putting a ton, a ton of time into it. And I'll just pick one uh, as an example. Uh, let me see what's a, what's a cool one to show. Settlement. Okay, so let's, let's go with govern, governance params as an example. Uh, at the moment, we're adding governance params so we can start testing different variables on the network. And you can see that we can have end-to-end -end integration testing and load testing done through uh, natural language, right? So like given that the user has something and given that the state of the network is X, we can start sending requests and start validating things. And then like all of this can be run literally by running make test end to end. It's, you can imagine us using ChatGPT to form tests like this as well. You don't even, in the future, not potentially not need to know how to code to run it, to create integration tests or at least to verify things end to end. Um, you can think when it comes to tokenomics and you want to validate that certain things work in a certain way. Um, this is really going to enable a lot. So kind of just just to cover over what we just saw is you know scaling a local network, having full visibility and observability into everything that's going on. Um, having uh, like pretty detailed instruction set to go through it as well. And I wanted to go even slightly deeper uh, into the code with more fine grain control in the terminal and the CLI, because that's what developers like to do, by running a gateway and a supplier myself, and then sending an end-to-end -end relay. So I did cheat a bit uh, in the sense that I have, you know, the commands prepared here uh, for the sake of speed. But let's say I want to kind of check the, uh, the height of our local Ethereum node. Currently, I'm sending this troll request into the abyss, so it obviously fails to connect. But uh, let's just say that I start running a gateway. So uh, in the future, we'll dive deeper with a whole explanation to what an AppGate server is. Um, not going to do that today. But what I'm doing here is manually running a gateway uh, in my CLI. And then I can send a request to that gateway. So, but you, you can see that even though I keep sending the request to the gateway, uh, because I'm trying to act as a service that's not supported, uh, that there's that has no suppliers on this tiny local network, uh, it doesn't work. Right? And you can see the application is getting an error, the gateway is getting an error, but luckily, uh, setting up a relay miner, which is a supplier, is also just as easy. Uh, I kind of already put together the config locally, uh, and all I did was copy them from here. Um, like everything is copied straight from this very long quick start guide, which is publicly available. So we send this relay miner, we set up this relay miner, which is uh, I'm like a local node runner. And uh, as soon as we start running the same curl command, so getting the eat block height, uh, it's every other one. I'm, I'm not going to go into why that is uh, right now. I can answer that question if anyone's curious. But here we are, literally getting a response of the height of the local Ethereum node from an application to a gateway to a supplier um, through the power of the CLI, which developers potentially want. But you can also use the UI if that's how you wish to um, kind of if that's your preferred way. And there, uh, and there are pros and cons to 
either one, depending on the problem that you're solving. Uh, so it's re really kind of developer specific based on the task at hand. And if we actually scroll down, like this, this is this little diagram represents what just happened, which is kind of a curl command going through an app server, to a really minor, like the entire flow. I literally just spun up the services and the entire network locally. It's a one validator network. And hopefully it shows like how simple, lightweight it is. I think, I personally think this is the best, uh, at least Web3 development environment and tool sets I have ever seen. Um, I hope that we'll get to present it at some conferences or workshops in the future. And uh, I will kind of uh, stop there for questions or anything else. Um, but before I do, I want to call out that like the entire protocol team has been hard at work, not just on the business logic over the last few months, but also creating and enabling this. And uh, I think it's a really great feat of uh, engineering that I'm, uh, I'm proud of on behalf of the team. That was a lot in about five to 10 minutes, but, but I'm gonna pause and uh, open up to questions if anyone has any. And applause if anyone has any of those two. Thank you, thank you. Um, but yeah, kind of if, uh, if there's nothing else, what I would say is we're going to be opening up bounties to um, implement both, you know, core business logic for Canon as well as more future looking uh, work. Um, one of the things that uh, I'm personally excited about is what this will enable in terms of experimentation with tokenomics. So there's going to be base level tokenomics, but we can see it evolving. And we're going to have the dashboarding for it. We're going to have the telemetry for it. We're going to have really everything we need to make sure that it's not just the core dev team that can contribute to the protocol, but it's, but it's everyone. Uh, whether you're or protocol contributor or uh, a gateway developer and you want to experiment that side of things, really like enabling the entire stack to test and develop end to end is uh, what we're doing here. And um, yeah, yeah. And the last thing I'll say is if you have questions uh, after the fact, because I will need to jump off shortly, please use the Canon general uh, channel on Discord. That's kind of where I monitor it, Shane monitor it, monitors it, uh, as well as the rest of the protocol team. So. Thank you, guys. Yeah, I I, would, I just want to reiterate on what Oshansky said in terms of uh, uh, this really being kind of a revolutionary tool for uh, protocol developers. Uh, quick story, my brother started to look into Shannon uh, yesterday and deployed his own local net and was just completely blown away that he was able to quite literally get going in just a few moments. Um, I actually know that there's been a number of contributors that have already started deploying with this quick guide. And the fact that they can legitimately start get, get all actors, get all visibility, uh, si simultaneously through essentially two commands. Um, that really is a crypto first. Um, granted, there are teams out there that will have, uh, you know, large scripts and, uh, you know, large systems that, you know, allow them to deploy local test nets, you know, with one click or something. Uh, but that's inside of a specific system. What's great about this is anyone can deploy it with literally, as he was saying, just two commands. Um, yeah, this this really opens the door to uh, folks who want to do bounties, folks who want to get into the protocol itself, uh, people who want to participate in Shannon, a super easy way to just immediately get in 
and start playing around, start learning how it works. So major kudos to the protocol team for building all of that. Thanks, Shane. And just as you were speaking, one other thing that I remembered is that we already have pretty good instructions to use Docker Compose for testnet, but very, very soon, uh, kind of the Docker container for that will come out as well uh, so that we can um, start putting that forward as well. So it's, uh, but this is specifically target at uh, local net developers on your per on your machine, even when you don't have a, a network connection. So, you know, we can keep developing on, on a long plane flight for those who like to do that too. And if there's nothing else, um, again, Chan in general is where please submit your questions, but I will hand it off back to Shane for uh, our regular scheduling of the Builders Hall. Awesome. Uh, fantastic start, uh, but we'll get back into, uh, now we'll kind of transition into our uh, regular announcements, and then I'm gonna be doing a deep dive on some tokenomics. Uh, so, Zach, feel free to share your screen, and then uh, after you're finished, I will share my screen, and I'll get into the deep dive on tokenomics. Would it be easier to just have you share your screen? Because I only have the, the one slide there, so unless you need a minute. Uh, actually, uh, yeah, I need to move uh, a window around, so just go ahead yourself. Cool. All right, give me a second, everybody. Queuing it up. Thanks again, Olshansky. Really appreciate you jumping in and doing that. Um, and like uh, like we've been doing, all of these videos are going up on YouTube in their own playlist. So that way, if uh, people are coming in to build or um, want to start developing, there's a specific playlist for them to jump in and start learning from. Let me share my screen here. It's being a little wonky. Let me know if uh, this works for people. Can you see my screen? Yep. Yep. Looks great. Cool. OK. Um, great. So yeah, regularly scheduled builders all hands. So um, today, Shane's going to do a deep dive. Actually, what is your deep dive on today, Shane? Uh, it is going to be uh, tokenomics, so talking about some of the uh, new mechanisms that uh, we're adding into tokenomics, which kind of complete uh, complete all the research uh, that uh, I've myself and and the protocol team has been doing into tokenomics. Amazing, yeah, you've been working pretty hard on that over the last uh, well, definitely the last couple of weeks, but probably the last couple of months as well. So uh, excited to hear what you have in store for us on that. I'm just going to do the usual kickoff with some housekeeping stuff and, and grants updates. So um, for anybody who was in the ecosystem call yesterday, you probably heard that uh, Gandalf is back under discussion again. And so we have the video up on YouTube if you want to watch the recap on it. Um, and Shane, I don't know if you want to give more details on that towards the end of the call as well. But it's an important discussion to have as we uh, move back into Shannon. So for anybody who is a node runner, um, I know Miss Kitty had some questions yesterday. Really want to have that discussion in public as much as we can to try to understand um, what is the best way to roll this out going forward. And um, I know that sometimes small providers are in contention with large providers. So we want to make sure we get all the sides out here so we can make a smart decision. As far as actual proposal votes, we don't have any up this week. So uh, if you're a voter, you get to keep your, your wallets closed for another week. Um, I didn't put this in here, but creds update should be going to the forum either today or tomorrow. Uh, so if you're wondering what happened with the the new governance system, uh, Jack and Ben have been working on updating it and making sure that we have everybody's kind of feedback from the last round taken into account. And so we're going to put that on the forum, make sure that, that everybody's aligned on that, and then 
uh, put that up to a vote to figure out how we can push forward and basically update our governance and get most of you who don't have a vote uh, the ability to come in and vote. So that's the goal. A couple of grants updates. So if you are on a quick grant, um, all the main payments should have gone out. If you haven't received one, please let me know. Hedgy is not set up for this month. Uh, like I was saying, we have a little bit of uh, crypto jujitsu we had to do this month. So we made payments for the month of May. So you should have the full amount if you have an open grant. If that number seems off, please DM me. Um, I'm also revisiting some of the mechanisms that are going on with grants right now. So I'm seeing a couple of, of things that are happening, which is some of the quick grants are actually probably projects with deliverables getting smuggled in under the quick grant uh, mechanism. And it doesn't really make sense. You know, in many cases, the way we should be looking at it is a payout based on milestones that are not tied to the start and end of a month. And so we're going to we're going to revisit the mechanism and give an opportunity for people who want to do a single payment deliverable or uh, a multi milestone deliverable over a time period that is not just a single calendar month. Um, and I think that's going to ease up some of the like, how do I do the work I want to do? And I'm forcing it into a quick grant. Um, and then we're also going to do some outlining of RFPs and stuff. And I'm open to suggestions here. So if anybody's like, oh, I've been trying to do a quick grant or I wanted to do blank, but um, it's not really working well, we're very open to it. I think one of the things we're looking at right now is there are a lot of grants open in the four to 5K range, and we really need to find a way to make sure that they're delivering a lot of impact immediately um, or just not opening so high. So that way our funds aren't being spent in areas that are a little bit more, um, I guess we would find out after the fact. So very open suggestions. Please DM. Please leave comments in the quick grants. Uh, very, very interested in to hear the take of people that are working on this stuff. And like Olshansky said, with new developer bounties um, and the Impact Hub that is coming out, we should have a lot more kind of scoped opportunities for developers to come in and work on projects. And so me and Shane have a, uh, a meeting on Monday to come up with some ideas. But if other people have ideas of things that would be nice to have been built for the network um, or things that will be important to have when Shannon launches, uh, would love to hear those. So office hours are a great spot. Again, DMs are a good one too. And the last but not least thing is retro pocket goods funding is officially live. So uh, I'm assuming most of the people here have done some work for the protocol in the last year. Uh, anything from February of 2023 is eligible. Well, not anything, but most work from 2023 is eligible. And this, again, can be protocol development or ecosystem support or um, basically any type of impact to the community, even if you have already gotten paid for it. So I really encourage you to go over to impact.pocket.network, uh, fill out an application. You know, at worst, you spend a couple minutes of your time and um, you have a high chance of getting some sort of funding from the work that you've done. So feel free to message me or reach out if you have any questions. Um, if you have any technical issues, please put those in the help desk in Discord. That's where we're tracking those. And then the final piece is we are building um, what we're going to call probably the Pocket Impact Hub, which is going to be kind of a one-stop shop for um, grants, education, onboarding, bounties. So just a place where people can go when they're new to the ecosystem and figure out how they can plug in and be impactful and then also get support to have the success they need. So um, that's coming soon. So. Uh, probably going to have a proposal on it in the next week or two into the into the forum. And I think that's it for me for the updates. Uh, Shane, do you want to do the protocol updates? Do you want to jump over and do a screen share now? Yep, let's do it. Which one? Uh, Let me know when you want me to stop sharing. Uh, Let's see. Oh, sorry. That's a that's a that's a dead slide. So sorry about that. Um, yeah. Here, I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, okay. I feel way older than I am when using Discord as like a piece of technology. Like the complications of even just a screen share, I'm always like, oh my God, I feel like my grandpa here. I know. All right, here we go. Share. Yeah, go live. Cool. All right. 
Uh, awesome. Uh, super excited to kind of go through this. Um, uh, in, in terms of a quick protocol update, uh, basically the uh, public test net is uh, we're we're shooting for uh, potentially next week. There are currently three um, three items uh, on the protocol team's list that they are tackling that are blockers to fully launching a public facing uh, test net. Um, that uh, yeah, they they're some of them are newer. Some of them are uh, have been around for about a month that they're just now finishing up. Uh, the biggest one is the governance parameters. So they're adjusting the governance or making it so you can adjust the governance parameters, which is going to be important with a public testnet because you might need to change something uh, and you need to have all those parameters there. So it's this module for governance parameters. And um, once that is complete, along with some uh, a few of the other uh, more recent items, uh, we expect to be able to announce a regenesis and move forward with getting more participants on the uh, on the test net. Um, so in terms of, uh, yeah, I'm happy to answer, you know, more questions about, you know, protocol things uh, in general. Um, we're going to be doing an open floor here in a moment. Uh, but for kind of my deep dive, what I wanted to do is I wanted to uh, go into just a few more uh, mechanisms that we've put together uh, for a possible uh, Shannon tokenomics MVP and just kind of explain uh, part of the research and what's going on. And we're going to very shortly be releasing a lot more information uh, that will help a lot more people actively get involved in the research process, in the uh, modeling process, and, and really in understanding Shannon as a whole. So uh, be looking out for that. But at least for now, I wanted to go over some of the areas that we're uh, currently thinking about. Um, just to give a quick recap before I get into uh, this new information about tokenomics and past builders calls, I've uh, I've done a uh, a couple deep dives into a couple different areas, um, and so ultimately this is kind of uh, the state of where Morse is. Um, you can see we're doing about you know 400 million relays a day. Uh, we burn one pocket, but we mint a lot of pocket. Uh, but that's to keep the staking APR, you know, around 9% for stakers. Uh, that is great for the staking ecosystem, but it creates a lot of challenges, which is why we have to have permission, or why we have to have permissioned gateways. We can't have permissionless gateways uh, because with that kind of burn to mint ratio, uh, that means anyone could just start minting, basically minting pocket on their own by only burning one pocket to send a, or uh, burning one pocket. So uh, we can't have that, which is why self-dealing uh, is mitigated by having permission gateways and then having that controlled via PNF, who does legal contracts so that uh, if anyone were to engage in that, it would be bad for their business. Uh, and I explained the, uh, what I call the tokenomics trilemma that we're kind of dealing with, uh, where you either can have permissionless gateways uh, and staking a APR uh, or address self-dealing. They all, you, you can't have all of them all simultaneously, at least with the current, uh, current thought process that is a part of Morse's uh, tokenomics. So this is where Morse is today, where, yeah, we have a good staking APY, we have self, or we address self-dealing, but you can't have permissionless gateways. So that's where we are. If we kind of switch it to where we have permissionless gateways and self-dealing, we can't have a good staking APR. Uh, or if we have permissionless gateways and a good staking APR, how do we deal with the self-dealing um, uh, within Pocket? So what we're shooting for is this middle ground, uh, a completely new way of thinking about tokenomics and looking at tokenomics so that we can achieve all of these simultaneously. Uh, and so in the past, uh, and you could actually look at different builder calls, uh, and we're, I'm going to be putting together a resource uh, when I launch these tokenomics uh, uh, resources that will allow you to look back at other calls that I've done. But in past calls, we looked at the question of uh, how do we prevent a node from sending relays uh, to only their own nodes to mint extra pocket? 
Uh, and we talked about distributing those rewards evenly across all suppliers in a session. Now, this uh, this mechanism, this isn't necessarily new. This has actually been uh, kind of part of sh the Shannon vision ever since the very beginning. Um, this prevents someone from, hey, I'm going to send all the, I'm going to send relays only to my node and just mint pocket. Uh, by distributing it to all nodes in the session, they can't have that kind of uh, targeted gaming, if you will. Uh, and then the other question we had to address what is, okay, well, uh, if suppliers are getting paid evenly inside of a session, how do we make sure that suppliers are doing real work in each session? Because now, hey, you get paid if you're just a supplier. So what's to prevent people from spinning up a supplier that's not actually connected to a chain source, right? Uh, they can't actually serve any relays. So, uh, you know, and then they don't have the infrastructure cost, but then they still get to be a part of the reward share. Well, we can't have that. So uh, what I originally coined Q, uh, useful QoS, um, which we're, we're still working on all these names. No, don't consider any of these uh, namings permanent. But um, uh, the idea is to use on-chain data from gateways to identify suppliers that are not useful and jail them. And I gave this little example down here where you have uh, three different sessions. And as you can see, node four is clearly not up to par with the other uh, with the other nodes in those sessions. And so because of that, uh, the network will automatically jail them because they essentially are algorithm uh, through an algorithm, they are not uh, on par with whatever the parameters are uh, to be considered a useful node. So in this case, this uh, node that is not actually performing in any meaningful manner gets jailed. So that's how we prevent, uh, uh, you know, bad nodes or at least completely useless nodes from being a part of the network. I mean, as you can see, gateways are still going to do QoS checks and, you know, favor certain types of nodes and things of that nature. And we're going to balance all that out as we go. Um, and we're going to have plenty of parameters so that all these things can be adjusted. But uh, at least the vision here is this gets rid of the ones that are objectively uh, no good. So you have to be useful to a certain standard in order to receive relays uh, or in order to receive rewards from those sessions. So then this is where uh, this is where then the new inf or the new stuff comes in, because uh, we still have another big question that we have to answer. So how do we prevent large suppliers from gaming small chains that they control? Because even if we have relays uh, or rewards are being distributed evenly to all these different nodes uh, inside of a session, if a supplier has a lot of nodes in that session, what's to prevent them from uh, still boosting that chain in order to generate more rewards, right? And I gave an example here. So this is like a small chain session that is predominantly uh, uh, run by, you know, a single supplier. And so, uh, you know, in any like given session in this case, you know, more than half of the nodes in that session are from a supplier. And at least from what we've modeled out, uh, and actually Ramiro helped with some of this modeling where even if it gets down to 20%, uh, even if a supplier has only 20% of a session, um, they could still potentially self self deal by just, you know, adding some extra traffic to just mint some extra pocket. Um, and so we obviously need to somehow prevent this. Um, we've prevented the ability to send relays to a specific node, but now we have to kind of take one step out and how do we prevent suppliers from uh, at least large suppliers uh, or independent suppliers that have a very particular niche from being able to self deal? So uh, how we do this is by delaying the economic uh, effects that relays have on a chain, making fake boosting a long and expensive process. Forgive part of my grammar here, but uh, the idea is by delaying and by making these kind of uh, uh, systems take more time uh, and require more expenses, we can dramatically reduce the likelihood that this would ever happen. And let me explain what that would look like. So today, uh, relays can spike on a service ID. 
instantly generating increased rewards for nodes on a specific chain. On the right, I gave this, uh, you can see the amount of relays maybe happening on the chain and, or sorry, on the left, you can see the relays happening on the chain. On the right, you can see the rewards uh, that are being generated. And so right now, how it is today, when you see that jump in relays, you also see that immediate jump in rewards. Uh, this has just been the nature of Pocket, where uh, there is, um, where everything is just directly correlated to the amount of relays. Uh, however, what we can actually do is something a little different, where instead of increasing the rewards for a chain uh, that has increased traffic, uh, wait, instead of, wait, by, instead, oh yeah, by steadily increasing the rewards for a chain uh, that has increased traffic, traffic spikes have to be sustained to maintain an effect on the chain rewards. So what this means is once you see the relays on the left suddenly spike, the rewards on the right doesn't, uh, doesn't immediately spike with it. Instead, it starts progressively increasing to match the demand. So what that does here is that means that you actually have to send a lot of relays over a course of a period of time in order to uh, generate some kind of profit. Because once you immediately start sending those relays, because you're not immediately getting the reward, it's going to cost you, right? And you have to sustain, let me go back to this, you have to sustain sending more relays to the chain in order for it to uh, uh, match, uh, in order for you to actually start generating a profit. So what this looks like uh, in, in like a real world scenario is if in the immediate uh, increase with how it is today, if uh, there's a fake boost of like 3x the amount of relays on a chain, right? Uh, and, and for this scenario, I specifically took uh, data from uh, base testnet. Uh, so on base testnet, which is a smaller chain, if it suddenly had 3x the amount of rewards, um, in a uh, non-delayed system like we have today, uh, it would it could cost around three hundred and eleven dollars uh, a week to in in pocket, of course, um, in a permission. And again, sorry, this is in a permissionless gateway world, right? So this is anyone can just spin up a gateway and start burning pocket in order to get relays. So in this scenario, someone's just spun up a gateway. Uh, they're funding it with uh, basically $111 uh, of pocket uh, per week. Uh, and in the immediate, if there's an immediate increase in rewards, what you have is after one week, uh, they can start having a return, just basically immediately. And that return is, uh, you know, after six weeks, they can make uh, a cool $600 on uh, just serving that one chain. Uh, or it would cost them 600, sorry, it would cost them $666. Uh, but the profit that they would actually generate is $700. So not only does that, uh, and this is profit on top of the cost. So they've already recovered all their uh, expense costs, but then they would have to, um, uh, but then they would get the extra $700 on top of that. So it's a profit, right? Uh, that's how it would look if you have an immediate crease increase in rewards. However, if you go to a delayed increase, uh, and let's take this same environment, they 3x the amount of um, uh, relays on that chain, and then it generates, uh, and it's because, and it costs $111 per month, you see a return actually takes six weeks, uh, because the uh, rewards have to steadily increase in order to match the 3x amount of traffic. And so it would actually cost them $666. And after six weeks, they all five weeks prior, they would have lost money, losing money, losing money, losing money, losing money until week six, where they finally have a profit. Now, for this kind of scenario to work, uh, there's a lot of elements, there's a lot of risk here because say suddenly one chain takes off and is now making 3x the amount of relays. The rest of the network would be able to calculate, oh, wow, this is where these rewards are now going. Uh, it, it's more profitable uh, because there's so much more um, 
relays on this network than there are nodes, this is going to become a profitable chain. And people can actually see the market effect uh, and be able to predict the market effect of relays on a given chain. So what ends up happening is you could actually have a supplier going back to this. You could actually have supplier B go, oh, wow, it's actually it could be way more profitable to actually uh, put more nodes because of the increase. And as it's increasing, uh, I want to put more nodes inside of that chain. So you could actually have it where supplier A is is losing the amount of uh, basically losing his percentage inside of a chain session. And as he loses percentage, he would uh, this attack actually means it would take him much longer to get to profitability. The profitability I'm showing here is if no one decides to enter this new chain and instead it boosts in three times the rewards and the rest of the network doesn't even blink. They don't do anything and uh, no one moves into that network even though there's uh, insanely increased uh, relays happening on it. That's not gonna be accurate. So it becomes a, a risky way of trying to boost your own rewards because you have to take a loss for a certain period of time before you would suddenly be able to profit from it. Uh, and actually in this kind of environment, the best thing you can do uh, for any node runner would actually be to focus on balance, whether uh, instead of focusing on some kind of fake boosting, because uh, this has a lot of risk and you have to be able to predict exactly how the network's going to respond over a six week period uh, to then only see $64. I mean, we're, we're talking about such a small gain, <laughs> such a small gain for this. It just doesn't even make sense. And you have to be able to read the mind of the entire network. Um, yeah, it, it's, uh, uh, so this is the benefit of delay of, of what I'm currently modeling out where you have a delayed increase in rewards. Uh, so this is, this will be, um, make it so we can allow, you know, any chain, uh, to be permissionless. Any chain can be added to pocket. Um, and uh, in order for there to be any meaningful gaming, uh, it takes a lot of time and the rest of the network could easily respond to it. Uh, the problem with today is again, when we're in the immediate increase is if someone were to just flash a bunch of relays, uh, you know, hey, I'm just gonna do this for a day and just let my uh, uh, nodes get more rewards before other people have a chance to move over, uh, that's, you know, that's a very legitimate strategy. And, you know, there have been things like some, some issues with uh, levels of gaming in the past with this kind of like flash, uh, uh, you know, flash boosting uh, in order to generate a little more reward. So, um, so what this, uh, what this would do for the supplier ecosystem prevents chain, uh, prevents large providers from boosting chains they run. Uh, and those are supposed to be small chains. Uh, prevents small uh, providers of small chains from boosting the chains that they're currently on. Uh, it also creates a more stable rewards for all node runners. Because again, uh, you know, when you have the variable uh, rewards, you have, uh, uh, you can see the rewards are going up and down, you know, as, as traffic goes. However, the rewards here would actually be stable. It would, it would be more stable, I should say. It could uh, it could be more stable, uh, and it wouldn't be as subject to uh, to change. Um, there would be uh, at least the mechanism that uh, we are looking at now. There uh, is way to uh, where there would be a little where there would be where you would lose rewards if a chain is out of balance. But if a chain is in balance, um, and you know really close to that balance, you would actually be able to sustain uh, uh, network average rewards in a much more easy fashion. Uh, and so that's why really the whole focus of suppliers would actually become, especially large suppliers, would be to find that balance uh, because that's actually where the most rewards are. Um, the possible drawbacks of this is relay spikes don't immediately translate into increased rewards. Yes, that is... Uh, that is something that it would be great if there was a way to to make it move faster or to counter that. And we're obviously open for ideas. Um, 
But uh, in order to prevent that kind of quick uh, immediate war or immediate uh, return on fake relays, we have to create a, a, a we have to add time in there. So uh, that's one of the possible drawbacks to this. But the benefits of what we get from this, we get permissionless gateways. We still maintain permissionless uh, suppliers. Um, yeah, like it, and we get stable tokenomics across the board, which is just very important to be able to uh, explain to new people entering the pocket ecosystem. Uh, so there's a lot of really positive uh, benefits with the possible drawback of um, providers that uh, basically move quickly to get on a chain because it's spiking suddenly. Uh, there wouldn't be that incentive uh, to move as quickly. Uh, they, within with sustained traffic, they can obviously see where a chain's going, and they can, uh, and it gives the ecosystem time to move over if this is going to be sustained traffic. But immediate spikes uh, don't uh, translate into immediate rewards. So, what about the future? Uh, how do we know that all these, uh, uh, that all types of data will work? with this tokenomics model. Again, this is we're, we're talking about very specific, like how do we allow small chains uh, to operate within pocket? How do we allow, you know, large or in, enable uh, uh, or prevent large providers from being able to, you know, control a small chain? This is all specific to blockchain RPC right now. Pocket ultimately can go into LLMs. It can go into other forms of data indexing. Um, sky's the limit. We're technically a completely open protocol. So then the question is, uh, won't there need to be different tokenomics models for different types of uh, data? And the fact is, yes, there will need to be different uh, ways that we interface uh, and have tokenomics work with different uh, service IDs. So Shannon will have the ability to have a very robust tokenomic system through the tokenomics module. Now, this is a Cosmos SDK module, um, and it will basically, uh, it defines rules like minting, burning, jailing, uh, and things of that nature within Shannon. Uh, and the beauty of how we're uh, wanting to design this is it can actually house multiple economic models, uh, each with completely different logic happening at the same time, and then apply them to different service IDs. So uh, let me let me just go ahead and, and uh, jump to this. This is how it could potentially apply uh, these tokenomics models uh, would apply, and we're talk we're calling them uh, token logic models uh, modules. So a TLM. So a TLM has specific logic for us uh, that can be applied to different service IDs. So Mint and Burn is the uh, is the one that we've talked about the most with Shannon. You know, one pocket equals uh, one pocket burned equals one pocket minted. Perfect. Um, it's a super clean system. And, uh, you know, that that that's what we want. However, uh, it doesn't account for many of the other things. And so we can actually stack other tokenomic uh, other TLMs on top of that one and then apply it to different uh, different types of data. So like specific for blockchain RPC, we can have a champion boost, which uh, and we can have a supplier boost. Um, all these can kind of work together in order to make the system that I've been kind of talking about for the past uh, few builders calls. But what about AI? Like everything I've talked about doesn't really apply to AI in any of the same ways. Well, what if we want to have, you know, we still want to have a champion boost so that the uh, those uh, the people that are building those AIs are still getting a boost of rewards for um, uh, bringing their uh, their data source to pocket. But uh, what if their actual tokenomics should be uh, determined by compute units, right? We can actually have a compute units module that uh, TLM that is able to calculate compute units and then calculate cost and then correlate that with minting and burning and uh, and jailing and all that stuff. Uh, we could also take some blockchain RPCs and actually choose to apply them to the uh, compute token uh, TLM. And 
the great thing here is we could actually have blockchain RPC that users could actually pick and choose which one they want to use. Do they want to go through the compute token uh, TLM or do they want to go through uh, the uh, kind of more traditional uh, one relay uh, costs um, of, you know, specific amount. Uh, so it's just one cost per relay or do they want to go with the token compute or the compute token model? They could go either way. Uh, we could actually enable any data source on Pocket to actually have many different options that users could uh, choose from. So anyways, uh, and then in future, we've got all sorts, like what other future services are going to be hosted on date on uh, Pocket? We don't entirely know, which means we can have future TL TLMs that are able to meet those markets with where they're at. Um, and so these uh, TLMs, uh, basically they, uh, allows there to be these kind of like multiple sub modules inside the uh, tokenomics module itself that is built with the Cosmos SDK. Uh, and then kind of the goals is to allow new tokenomics model, uh, models to be introduced to the network on a service ID level instead of on a, on a global level. So one model doesn't apply to everything we can assign. Uh, we can then assign specific token uh, token models, TLMs, to specific service IDs, um, which would allow us to have all sorts of different data types. Anyways, uh, that's kind of the recap of where we're at with uh, with research. Um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of kind of the full features, you can see the full features here of what is being put into this uh, tokenomics module or, or tokenomics um, uh, research. We're going to be, I'm going to be releasing a lot more of this very shortly. Uh, it's just every every time I, I think I'm close to releasing, you know, we we realize that there's something else that needs to be taken account for. So then I have to go back and, you know, make sure that it's accounted for. But we're going to be releasing all of this. All of this will be completely vettable by the community. Uh, we're going to have open discussions about each of these features, each of these abilities. Uh, talk about the pros and cons, figure out what is worth having, what needs to be tweaked. Uh, there's going to be all sorts of conversations that we're going to be able to have uh, over tokenomics. Um, so far, at least what I've shared today, um, uh, the, the, the MVP model that I'm working with right now, uh, it's been currently reviewed by PNF, the protocol team. Oh, and then actually it's supposed to say pocket scam. Uh, they, they've, uh, uh, Ramiro has been great with reviewing a lot of this work and uh, providing feedback. So anywho, yeah, it's it's uh, a lot of people are uh, involved in kind of this discussion, but then it's needs to go to the whole community and open up to the community. So these are the features that are going to be available and we're going to start talking about them once uh, everything is fully buttoned up and able to share. Because I, I just don't want to share something too early where uh, we don't have um, uh, where there's just the conversation goes into uh, areas that weren't well uh, thought out. So I want to at least cover all the major areas so that we can actually have really productive conversations as a community and not get uh, hung up on uh, kind of rabbit trails. So that's why a lot of work is going into this. Cool. Uh, that's it then. Uh, happy to answer questions. I know we're literally right up against the uh, top of the hour. So um, uh, but happy to stay a few more moments if folks have questions. You've got one in the chat there. Okay. Oh, okay. I haven't checked. Why that. does mid yeah. equal burn not work for everything? Ramiro, feel free to jump off mute too. I was kind of confused with the table because if you pay what is being minted, it's, I know, it's like the free market. So I, I'm not sure why it's, it won't work for other types of AI inference or anything else. Well, mint and burn is again a uh, uh, mint and burn at least in this context uh, is uh, well okay. So maybe it'd be better to clarify mint and burn in this context with like blockchain RPC um, is uh, you know not involving any other computing other than. Uh, a cost per relay. With AI, there might need to be certain uh, uh, where we charge on something other than a one relay equals this much pocket. 
uh, most RPC providers, or at least a lot of them, uh, including um, uh, Alchemy, who kind of coined this compute units uh, in terms of how they charge, you know, they there's different requests that have different levels of uh, uh, compute units, which is determined, which then determines how much each cost or each call costs. So, uh, so in a world where if we want to have AI inferencing, where every single request, regardless of how big or how small, uh, costs the same across the board, then yeah, we could absolutely have just a mitt and burn. If we're using any other kind of uh, calculating, or if we want to go into a, a system of compute units, then <coughs> that will obviously uh, that could obviously look different. Um, with uh, with that as well, if say we wanted to uh, incentivize more people to come uh, to bring, like say there's not a lot of traffic for LLMs at the beginning, but we want to create a, a boost for LLMs uh, so that even though there's lower relays, uh, they could actually get a boost in rewards. We can um, uh, we can allow that. Uh, we could create a, a TLM similar to what we're doing with blockchain RPC, but you know it could be literally a uh, LLM boost, right? And it has certain rules uh, and it's governed by certain parameters, right? So kind of the the vision of this is you can have all these different types of data types. We don't need to know. Ex we don't need to apply one system to all markets. We can be flexible and uh, apply different systems to different markets depending on their need, depending on how much uh, we want to reward a certain data type that maybe is being introduced in the pocket or what have you. Does that uh, answer answer question uh, efficiently? Cool. Uh, Zaytar, what are champion rewards? Champion rewards are something I talked about a few um, uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, basically, it allows data sources themselves to uh, get a share in the rewards minted. So, if uh, uh, so, let's let's take for example uh, Avalanche. The Avalanche uh, client, uh, you know, those developers, they're creating the software that the suppliers are running. So a champion boost uh, actually provides them a part of the rewards uh, from the relays that are happening through Avalanche. So this would allow Pocket to directly provide revenue for chain clients uh, or LLMs or any of that, because if that data source is on Pocket, uh, the owner of that data source, whoever's championing the development of that data source, gets uh, a share of the rewards. Uh, yeah, Ramiro, that that's a good point. This this uh, uh, this graph or this table is is a little off it should say relay based minting instead of uh yeah or it had a different name than just mint and burn so yes agreed yeah yeah now now you can hear me now can you hear me or am i might yep yep we can hear you okay <laughs> yeah i agree with what you say and yeah it's i think it's it's only the the raw name wrong but you are right with what you say it's just that Cool, cool. Um, yeah, if there's any more questions, uh, happy to get them. We are five minutes over, so I do want to wrap this up if there's not uh, other questions that uh, came, people had through this presentation. And I think that's uh, that's a wrap. Five minutes over. Got a couple of big presentations today. Feels like a solid builder's call.
Yeah. Cool, cool. All right. Well, then, yeah, let me just wrap things up. We'll, uh, uh, much more information to come. Uh, this is pretty much my uh, uh, sunset, sunrise to sunset, literally right now, is just working on all this, flushing it out, and then also getting uh, everything kind of in a way that the community, people can vet this, people can uh, dig in themselves. Um, so, yeah, a lot, a lot of people have already been digging into it, which is awesome, been getting a lot of great feedback. Um, but yeah, super excited. And uh, I guess we'll catch you in two weeks. Builder call in two weeks. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thank you.